is morning in Brazil as the country begins three days of national mourning for Pele. Let's head live to Rio and speak to Tim Vickery. Tim, thanks so much for being with us. I suspect you've not had a huge amount of sleep. Um, sum up the emotions for us, I guess, because naturally huge sadness. But to what extent is it also a celebration of the great man's life? Well, it's a carpet of gloom today. Uh, it's very heavy skies uh, and there's a leaden feel about the mood in the streets. Uh, this wasn't unexpected. Uh, we knew uh, a month ago that his body was no longer responding to chemotherapy. So it, it had become a question of time. But it's one thing knowing it's going to happen and another thing it actually happening. And for the vast majority of Brazilians, this is the first day that they can remember without Pelé, without the greatest ambassador that they've ever had. So there's an air of sadness, but you're absolutely right. There's also an air of celebration. Um, they're very, very proud of the way that this story has been picked up and covered by the international media. The love, the respect um, that the world had for Pelé. Personally, I, I thought it was appropriate and fitting that his last lucid days on earth were during the World Cup because uh, it gave a chance for the football community gathered there in Qatar to send that message of love and affection to Pelé, uh, who, after all, built the World Cup. It's the house that Pelé built. It became this month-long festival made-for-TV giant event because of Pelé more than, it, more than, than anyone else. So uh, it's, it's clear that along with the sadness there's plenty to celebrate. The funeral arrangement, just quickly, because uh, if anyone there with deep pockets really does, does want to come and pay respects, it is possible. Um, Brazil has its presidential inauguration on Sunday. That's pushed the Pelé thing back a little bit. Uh, his body will be, his coffin will be laid in the centre circle of the pitch at Santos, the club he played for for 18 years, from Monday morning Brazil time until Tuesday morning, open to the public, so anyone can now wander in and pay their last respects to Pelé. Tuesday morning, that um, coffin will go through a procession through the streets of Santos, passing the house where his, his mother is still alive, 100 years old, Donna Celeste, uh, before going to the cemetery where there'll be a private service for the family. So anyone with deep pockets who really thinks that they want to be there, there's time to get on a plane and pay your last respects to Pelé. And I suspect there might be a few as well. You spoke there, Tim, about the great pride that the people of Brazil have as to how this has been covered overseas. But what about the reaction in the media in Brazil itself? Well, I've uh, picked out a couple of uh, uh, newspaper covers. This one I liked very much from newspaper in Sao Paulo, which was uh, the state where he lived, the Estado de Sao Paulo. Uh, I hope you can see that there. That's saying Pelé has died, if it can be said that Pele dies. And the text inside says, like the gods of the Olympus, Pele doesn't get old or die. He'll always be alive, marked in the global memory as the Brazilian who used football to make humanity dream. That, I think, is, is the best quick summing up of the tone that I've seen. Uh, another one which I, I found interesting, this is from a, a Rio newspaper, the Correo de Manhã. Uh, see there? And uh, the, the headline here is... The pain that unites Brazil brings about a truce. Now, the truce that, that that's referring to is the political divide, where we, the, the far-right supporters of the leaving president, uh, Bolsonaro, haven't wanted to accept the result and have been involved in terrorist activities. This pain hits both sides of the political divide. So there, there, there's something which unites a polarised country. And that, that, there's a reference there to that extraordinary incident in the late 60s where the presence of Pelé brought a temporary truce to the civil war that was going on in Nigeria at that time. So th those were the, the, the two covers that I thought were, were most interesting. But there's plenty of other newspaper covers with fabulous images of Pelé celebrating a goal, punching the air. And as the Estado newspaper said, that image, that will live for all time because all of us, Rob, you and myself, you know, make our living from this in the most insignificant of capacities. All of us are nothing more than midgets standing on the shoulders of a, of a giant called Pelé. And you will know far better than me, but, but it's something to convey to, to a lot of our viewers, the, the level of rivalry that exists between the South American countries and particularly Brazil and Argentina. But I guess this is a moment that transcends any sort of footballing head-to-head. -head. Well, for an entire generation of Argentines, 
1970 is a reference for them as well. Remember, Argentina didn't qualify for the 1970 World Cup. I was uh, I was reading a declaration from Jorge Valdano, who won the World Cup with Argentina in 86, a big figure in Spanish football, a big footballing philosopher, Valdano. And he was remembering that he first got a TV. His mum bought him a TV for the 1970 World Cup uh, and uh, watching Pelé in, 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 on his own in a kitchen is, is, is the moment where football really begins to take over his life. So um, I always hate it when these Pelé Maradona uh, debates become adversarial. You use one to attack the other. That's not the way it, it, it should be at all. Both of them should be celebrated. Both of them, I think, were complex figures. Uh, I think the uh, international press didn't do a, a particularly subtle job or a particularly good job in the years that it was desperate to present Pelé as a good guy and Maradona as a bad guy. The history of both of them is, is more complex than, uh, than that. And I think there's been a backlash. There have been a backlash against Pelé because of that over the last few years. Some of the younger generation uh, identified more with the rebel stance of Maradona than with uh, what they saw as a kind of corporate uh, man in a suit air of, of Pelé. And there'd even been a backlash against his greatness of a player, as a player. Well, surely now people are seeing the clips and realizing that we are talking about the great. Because when you look at clips of Pelé, Rob, it's almost as if you've got a, a player from today with all the advantages of contemporary physical preparation and dietary studies and all the rest of it, and you've taken him back, you've transported him back in time 60 years to show the oldies how to do it. He was that far ahead of his time. He was a global icon before football had fully globalised. He is the man who built the World Cup. Uh, and uh, so some of those people who, who have perhaps been knocking him and saying, oh, everything was easy back then, I think maybe now when they've got a chance to sit down and look at those clips. Now look at this pass. This is the pass that many of his teammates say won the World Cup to set up Jairzinho for that goal against England. The beautiful simplicity of it. I spoke once to Mario Zagallo, who was a coach of that team, had been Pele's teammate in 58 and 62. And he said, you know, the calm that other players have in the centre circle, Pele has in the penalty area. This goal that we've just seen, the first goal against the, in the final against Italy, he's been marked by Bernic, the Italian defender. And after the game, Bernic said, I took the field thinking that Pele was just another player. I was wrong. Yeah, I think I, I read that quote earlier, Tim, and I've got it written down, actually. I told myself before the game he's made of skin and bones just like everyone else, but I was wrong, which is, which is a lovely quote. Um, I just wanted to, to actually reference something you said there about sort of the pressure and the comparisons with, with Maradona. Uh, and we saw a little shot there of, of Pelé being sort of carried off the field and off with, with fans sort of, you know, underneath him. The pressure of being the big Brazilian hope in the sport of football, we see it with Neymar now, but with, with Pelé, how much expectation and burden did he carry, particularly when he was a player? Well, he loved it. He loved that. And that, that's one of the things of the greatness of him as a player. It's never just, it's never just talent. It's, it's, it's also the mental side of the game. And uh, he, he loved that pressure. He was totally at ease and happy with the idea of, of, of being Pelé. And I love the fact that his, uh, his World Cup career is it's the classic story of the hero in three acts. You know, the, the, the hero appears as a 17-year-old kid, wins the Brazil's first World Cup, enchants the planet. The hero then in Act 2, he goes through trials and tribulations. He's injured in the course of the 62 World Cup. He's brutally kicked out of the 66 World Cup. He doesn't want to know anymore. He's not going to play any more World Cups. He doesn't play for Brazil for another two years after 66. Act 3, the hero is persuaded to have one last go, to come back, to bring the band back together again, if you like. Uh, and uh, the hero leaves the scene on that high of Mexico 70. He could have played 74, but that sense of theatrical timing, he knew that it couldn't possibly be better than what he did in Mexico 70. In Mexico 70, you know, the, the, the TV images glistening in the, in the, in the Mexican uh, afternoon sunshine, they had a kind of other world quality to them. And at that time, it was very common to draw a parallel between Brazil winning the World Cup in 1970 and the moon landing a few months earlier, because both of these were TV events where the images have this ethereal, uh, otherworldly quality. And I think ever since then, that has been the World Cup against which all subsequent World Cups are measured. That Brazil team has been the team against which all subsequent teams are measured. And Pelé has been the player against, uh, against whom all subsequent players have been measured. 
And one of the sort of themes of a lot of quotes I've seen over, over the last few hours or so is that 10 was just a number before Pelé came along. There are, there are some discussions about retiring the shirt as a whole, but, but what sort of lasting tributes do you think there will be from now that, that will be done, particularly in Brazil, to, to honour Pelé's life? I know that there are already statues and all sorts within Brazil, but what else might, might be added to, to the tributes? I hope the number 10 isn't retired because I want someone to be watching these clips and thinking, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that maybe even better. Why take that dream away? Because for me, any time, anywhere in the world, you see someone coming up with one of these moves, that for me is a tribute to Pele because that's a legacy that, 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 that he leaves. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that this is someone who was born just 52 years after slavery was abolished in Brazil. Uh, was for a while, family plunged into poverty, was a shoeshine boy who ended up shining more brightly than anyone else in the history of football. So the story of Pelé, on the one hand, it's a tribute to his own extraordinary talent and determination. On the other, it's a tribute to the democratic nature of the game of football. So you don't need, you don't need money, you don't need equipment. It's open to all shapes and sizes. So there could be now a kid growing up in Nigeria, in Indonesia, anywhere around the world who's inspired by those, those clips of Pelé and wants to do it himself one day. And that, for me, is the greatest tribute that you could pay, pay to him.